Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. He's a professional baseball player who plays outfield with the Cincinnati Reds. He played collegiately with the University of Nevada in Reno and received the biggest bonus ever given to an undrafted free agent in 2016. He's also known as Captain Chaos. Let's welcome into the show, TJ Friedel. TJ, welcome to the show. Hey, Tommy. Thanks for having me on. You are welcome. How did the nickname come about? Who gave it to you? You know, it came up, uh, I think at some point this year. I don't even remember how it started. I think it was, uh, you know, one of our, one of our announcers, um, I don't, I don't know, but uh, it may have been Jim Day who started it, but uh, I think it stemmed from maybe a post-game interview of just, like, me laying down bonds and running the bases and, like, you know, something I've kind of always taken pride in is getting on the base pass, getting on base, and kind of just creating chaos with my speed and my legs. And um, I think it just kind of picked up from there and then, and then hit the ground running. <laughs> you attended Foothill High School in Pleasanton, California, and were a two-sport baseball and basketball athlete. As somebody that helps high school kids get connected to colleges, tell me, how did playing multiple sports help you? You know, that's actually something I always talk about and I try and talk about a lot. Um, playing multiple sports growing up was so important for me. And, and you know, I think that helped me develop my athleticism, um, you know, my speed and, and just playing different sports, you know, engages different parts of your body. And, and you know, baseball is taxing as it is, but then taking a break for me, that was the biggest thing is taking a break from that sport that I was playing for the last three or four months, whatever it may be now transitioning into another sport, focusing on different aspects of that sport and, you know, trying to get better at that specific sport while I guess during the whole time building my athleticism to where I am today. Um, you know, I remember growing up having weekends with my parents going, uh, basketball to soccer to football <laughs> based like just hectic changing in the car going from one game to the next to next um you know that's something you know i always thank them and appreciate them for putting up with that because now as a father i know that those days are coming for me um so you know it's just something that i took a lot of pride in um playing as many sports as i could and all day, you know, I do see a lot of kids who play year round. There's nothing against that, and there's nothing against getting better at that specific sport. But I do think it's very important to let your body rest and take a break and try something else, or put your effort and your mind towards something else to take you away from that sport for a little bit. Just kind of like a reset. Just like I play 162 games a year, but then I get five months off to to be with my family, to spend time with my family, and and there's a reason that the major leagues isn't all year round. Mm -hmm. His baseball acting as it is, um, you know, and then you get into the off season, you get some time to rest and then you build back up, you work out, you hit, you throw, you build back up to spring training. Then you start all over again. Yeah. You know, and what, the one thing that I'm always big on with two sport athletes is you're going to start using different muscle groups and you're not going to overtax a certain muscle over and over and over because these kids just, they got it in their head that they cannot take a break. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> Just use a different set of muscles a different way is going to is going to be so much beneficial for you in the long run. No doubt. And, you know, like you said, I think um, especially throwing, right? Like that's not a natural motion for your body anyway. So to give your arm a rest and, and to let your body relax. And then, like you said, go focus on a different muscle. Go play basketball, go jump, mm -hmm. you know, get, get there, play football, you know, work on speed and agility, things like that, that all come around to whatever sport you end up wanting to pursue long-term, whatever that sport may be. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely a very important thing. What was your college recruitment like? Cause I see you started on as a walk on at the university of Nevada. Yeah. So, um, that was kind of a different process for me. You know, I had some, some coaches coming up playing travel ball in the Bay area who had some connections and, you know, when I was in high school, there really wasn't the showcases that there are now okay. where, it's like, I feel like it's every weekend. There's a different showcase to go out and, and you know, play in a tournament. Um, when I was growing up, we had those big tournaments in Arizona, SoCal, like all these big tournaments with good teams. Um, but for me personally, I reached out to the university of Nevada, um, through email 
and they sent me a flyer for a fall camp that they did, which I ended up going to my senior year. Uh, I think it was October of my senior high school. I went up there and it was a three day camp where you basically do, you know, run a six yard dash and you do all this stuff that you would do at a regular showcase. You just do it in front of that coaching staff, mm-hmm. you play some games. Um, so for me, I went up to that camp, um, ran like the best 60 time. I ran like a six, three, 60 yard dash. Whoa. And I know it was, you know, I, <laughs> great. Um, but at the time that was when, uh, the longtime coach Gary powers was still there and buddy goldsmith, who was the assistant, they were running the camp and that was 2013. That was 2012. I graduated high school 2013. So then when I went in my freshman year, Gary powers actually retired and Jay Johnson came in as the new coach from San Diego, whole new coaching staff. So at that time, um, I'm sorry, let me rewind. When I was at the camp, my senior fall, I, uh, coach powers and buddy Goldsmith pulled me aside and said, Hey, you know, we're very interested in you, but we don't have scholarship, but we would give you a preferred walk on, um, which no scholarship money, but we'd like to have you be a part of the team at, at least through that freshman fall and then kind of see where things go. And then, you know, he, he uh, Gary retired. And, uh, so at that point it was like a, fresh start. I didn't know Jay Johnson. He had no idea who I was. He just kind of went off of what coach powers and coach Goldsmith told him about some of the guys coming in. And, uh, so that was, I guess my recruitment. Um, I had a couple of Juco offers when I was in high school from actual school, like, you know, just to go there and and go the Juco route. Um, but I wanted to, you know, really test myself and I wanted to go and, and go to Nevada and just see what I can do, you know, and that's all I've ever really tried to do is just have an opportunity and try and showcase what I can do in my potential and then make it go from there. I mean, you're at the highest level now, but this is where I, a question I want to ask, because I'm hoping that the young kids that are listening to this will take note of this. Your freshman year, what kind of playing time did you get? Because I know some of these high school kids think, oh, I'll go play D1 as a freshman. I'll get all this playing time. So what kind of playing time did you get? Pinch running, some pinch. It, you know, just things like that off the bench. Um, I didn't even find out I made the team until the end of fall camp freshman year Mm. because there were still a lot of guys trying out. A lot of the walk-ons still had to try out and prove themselves and make the team. Um, Me and my, you know, he ended up being my roommate, Justin Bridgman. We were both preferred walk-ons from the previous coaching staff. Um, But even though we were on campus, we still had to stand out and make the team. And, you know, I also remember the day we were playing St. Mary's in Reno. And after the game, that's when uh, Jay Johnson told me and Justin in front of the whole team that, that we had made the team for that year. You know, it was special. My, my parents were up there. They had come up for that game. And so I was able to go outside and tell them. And, um, you know, that was such a grateful moment for me. Um, but, you know, that, that next, there were a bunch of senior juniors and seniors and older guys who right. had been established and been there. And so it was just kind of trying to find ways to stand out. It was a lot of pinch running, um, a lot of pinch hitting off of the bench in the seventh, eighth, and ninth in the freezing cold. Um, you know, I got some starts. I had some opportunities, but um, that was basically my freshman year. I think it was like 30 some. I appeared in 30 something games, but had like 50 at bats. Mm. Um, so, but that's another lesson that I was very thankful for, you know, because right. then you get my first couple of years in the big leagues were a lot of pinch hitting. And a lot of, you know, come in and pinch it off the bench. And so it wasn't foreign to me. And so all these lessons that I kind of learned in my college career helped me now. Your sophomore year, you were a red shirt. But mm-hmm. past that, there was a tweet that your outfielder, Cal Stevenson, that was the 2015 Mountain West freshman of the year, had transferred to Arizona. And this was a big loss for Nevada. But this tweet didn't sit well with you. Tell my listeners why this really jacked you up well you know it it was and you know i love cal stevenson i grew up playing with him he's from the bay area as well and and so he came in as a freshman and you know he was we had fall camp and he was a stud right and so he earned every bit of playing time he got um that sophomore year you know at the end of the fall i was basically just told hey um we're we're not going to play much we would pinch run you pinch hit you and so jay johnson was just like hey you know, what would you think about redshirting and just saving a year of eligibility instead of burning another year on pinch hitting and, and pinch running? And that was a hard pill for me to swallow. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, I'm once again very grateful that we had that conversation because I was able to spend that time 
working on all of the things that I knew I wasn't doing well and challenging myself and pushing myself. And I could have, I could have went back to Juco and I, and I could have went back home and, and kind of tried to go to different college, but instead I took that challenge and wanted to make myself better. I wanted to prove myself that I'm not just going to go to a Juco. I want to face my challenges head on and I want to make myself better to where I can prove myself. So that sophomore year happens and, and Jay leaves to Arizona and, and Cal and a bunch of guys leave with them. Um, and I remember seeing that tweet and I actually was going to play summer ball in Texas. And I screenshotted that tweet and I had that tweet kind of like as my screensaver for a little bit down there. Um, because to me it was, yeah, we lost Cal and, and he was the freshman of the year. He's a good player. But at the same time, it's like, I've been building myself up to, you know, not fill in, but like take that role mm-hmm. and I want to take that role and I want to make it better. You know, I don't want to, you know, if people are going to look at it like, Oh, we lost Cal. Now it's going to be a question mark in center field. No, I, I want to be that guy that steps up and fills in that role and tries to make it better. Um, so for me, it was just like the little extra motivation, that extra push of like, this isn't going to be a downgrade. Like we're not downgrading. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do what I can to make it better. You are the Wolfpack's most valuable position player in 2016. Your junior year, you're batted 401, which was 11th best in college baseball and had the second most triples. So obviously you use that for motivation, but when you got on the field, you also let your talents showcase. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was an unbelievable year. Um, and, and for me, when TJ Bruce came in, you know, him and him and Jake Silverman came in and took over the coaching staff. Um, and I think they just kind of let us have the freedom to be who we wanted to be, but they challenged you and pushed you every day. They had come from UCLA. And so they were really big on just challenging when we had stuff in practice and games, whatever it was, it was always a constant challenge. It was you competing against your teammates, but it was also the accountability standpoint of like, you're here to get the job done, get the job done. And I thrived under that because for me, that was kind of my motivation that had been the past two years. Now that I kind of got to exemplify that spring of, or I guess that fall of 2015, their first year. Um, And I remember maybe around October, that same time, uh, coach Bruce pulled me aside and uh, brought me in his office and told me, you know, I was going to be a big key part to that team um, and, and put me on scholarship for that year. And, you know, for me, um, it wasn't as much of like, okay, like I've, I've here, I've done it now I'm on scholarship, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be a big part of the team. For me, it was like now having that confidence of all the hard work that I put in the past two years of what I've been building myself up to be what I knew I could always be, but now having that confidence to go out and play and have the ability to play how I wanted to, um, I think really opened up a door for me to just be who I wanted to be on the field. And that's kind of where all that came from. You were going to be a captain your senior year, but TJ, what was the mistake you made by misunderstanding the MLB draft rule? Oh, it's wild. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I knew, uh, you know, I just read or I just come off red shirting, right? I never talked to an MLB scout in my life. I never thought about having an agent. I never thought about what pro ball entails, the draft, anything. Um, so I'm having a good fall. And this is before that spring of 2016. So, you know, football is going well. Um, and some, all of my roommates, I did some with five dudes in a house, five baseball guys in a house. Three of my roommates are every weekend going to talk to scouts or meeting up at a coffee shop, coming home with these questionnaires to fill out. And, you know, to me, I'm like, that's really cool. Hopefully for me next year, I get to do that kind of stuff. Now, I always thought, to be drafted, you had to be a junior in baseball, a junior in baseball, not in school or 21. Okay. That's what I thought the two things were. And, you know, me and all my roommates kind of thought the same, like, cause I was a redshirt sophomore. I only, I, that would have only been my second year of active eligibility because I redshirted. So we were, you know, I didn't really ask many questions because at that time I wasn't talking to scouts. So I was just under the impression that, you know, even, even through the whole spring, as everything happened through that whole spring of 2016, I still had no idea that I could be drafted until the week of the draft. When I got a call from a scout who asked me if I would want to be drafted. (laughs) And that was my first time. I remember I was with uh, Bryce Greger, um, one of my buddies, and I was in the car with his family and I was like, 
that's weird. I just, I just got a call asking if I want to be drafted. And it was like a shock. I never had an agent, never thought about going pro. So I actually just said, thank you, but no thanks. I'm very unprepared. I don't know what this all entails. So I, I'm going to go back to school. You end up signing with the U.S. National College team. And you still didn't know you were eligible for the draft then because you were eligible at that time, right? Yeah, yeah. So I knew um, I, during that time I knew because I'd gotten the call right before the draft. But I had said no. So at that time, I was just like, yep, I said no to the draft. So, you know, I'm going back to school. I went to St. Cloud in uh, Northwoods, played there for three weeks, I think, until I got invited to Team USA. Um, And that's kind of where everything started with the free agency. And once again, I had no idea about free agent signing. Like to me, when the draft was over, it was over. I didn't know that there was free agent signing and anything after that. So when did then it click in for you that, you could be drafted and there was this possibility could happen. Probably um, when, so for team USA, the first week we were in LA and it was a bunch of workouts and all of the guys that I was there with were sophomores the year before going to be juniors. None of them had registered. They were all big names, SEC, ACC guys, um, PAC 12 guys. So it was all for next year's draft. And I was the only one that, was a redshirt sophomore. So um, for me, it kind of all happened very quickly. A couple of teams reached out to me and called me at the trials and asked if I'd be interested in free agency. I still didn't have an agent at the time. And so um, Coach Bruce actually um, knew Adam Karen, who's my agent now, who called me and said, hey, you know, we'd like to represent you. They flew down to L.A. I met with them in L.A. during the trials. Um, and I was like, yeah, that would be great. I'd love to have you guys represent me. Um, And then from that point on, he kind of introduced me to what's going on. And during that meeting we had in LA is when he, you know, stepped back and told me, hey, here's teams have free agent money left over. Uh, Depends who signed for what during the draft and who has money left over. And um, at that time, there were a lot of teams with, you know, the $100,000 free agency money and stuff like that. And then that's kind of when the ball started going into like, it turned into, I guess, like a bidding war in a sense of like who has money left over. And, and that's when it got really hard for me because, you know, Adam told me, my agent said, you, you got to pick a number. You have to pick a number that in your head is like, if, if it reaches this point, I'm, I'm going to sign and I'm not going back to Nevada. You know, my house at Nevada still had all my stuff in it from the school year. <laughs> like my house still had all my stuff. I was going back to school. I was never, you know, had any plans of going anywhere else but back to Nevada. Um, And so I sat down with my family and we talked and and kind of set a number. And then it started clearing that. And I was like, well, what's happening? Like, (laughs) I've already committed this number. Now we're past that number. You know, and and actually my wife now, she, we just started dating. Um, We were very fresh into dating. And she had come out to St. Cloud to see me. And so she had just got thrown to the fire with me. I mean, we were both clueless and she didn't really know much about baseball to start with at the time. And so let alone during that mid season in Nevada, I'm explaining things there that happened in the game that she'd be like, Oh, like, yeah, awesome. Like, no, 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 it's not good. That that wasn't good. (laughs) Things like that. Like we're both kind of in this whirlwind of emotions of all this going on. Um, And so I remember kind of, I found out I made the team USA team. Once again, I wasn't on the team. I was kind of just there as a favor for coach Bruce. Um, He knew coach Horton, who was the head of the USA team and just asked kind of like, Hey, can you bring him down for exposure? Just some exposure for next year and get his name out there. Um, And, and I ended up making the team because I had some good games on there. Um, And just another uh, opportunity, right. And it's just kind of when those doors open and those opportunities open, it's just taking advantage of opportunities. Um, so I made that team and then we were in Taiwan and that's when it kind of started coming down to the final couple teams. And now Taiwan, I think is 12 hour time difference from here. And I'd be waking up and I'd wake up to like 30 emails between my mom, my dad and my agent <laughs> of a rundown of everything that's happening. And I'd wake up and be like, what is happening? Right now? <laughs> it's, it's, I'm in Taiwan. And, and so, um, yeah, I think that whole thing was just like such a, I think it was two weeks, but it felt like two years. Wow. It felt on my me- mentally, physically to, to try and think about like, I'm playing on Team USA in Taiwan, playing the best in Taiwan at the time. 
with a bunch of guys who next year are going to be first rounders anyway. And I have this opportunity to sign this free agent contract. It was, it was crazy. It was the biggest bonus ever given to an undrafted free agent of $732,500. Here's what I'd like to know. What was the first thing that you bought? (laughs) Um, So I, the first thing I got was a 2016 Camaro. Um, This, this car that it was just like this car when I was in high school that I'd always see driving around like, man, I love that car. And so, (laughs) So when I went back to Reno after my, after that off season, I got a, I got a Camaro and I drove it for about maybe a year. Wasn't a fan. <laughs> I, had a, I had a Jeep Grand Cherokee, like an old grown up Grand Cherokee and then a truck, a, a Dodge Ram 1500 truck. And then I go down to this Camaro where I'm like squatting down to sit in it. And then to get up is like an ab workout to get out of the car. <laughs> so so that lasts about a year and I'm like, I'm not really a fan of it. <laughs> you end up debuting with the Billings Mustangs in the Pioneer League Rookie League. Your first two at bats were home runs. I mean, how how rewarding was this after all this craziness you go through? You finally get into the professional leagues to start and you hit two dingers to start your career. I mean, that that whole that whole day was crazy. Like, cause I got, so after t- the Reds were, um, you know, they were, they were willing to let me finish out with team USA and be able to experience that opportunity, which I'm you know forever grateful for, because the things we got to do with that team USA team was incredible. Um, and then I came home and I had a week to go f- drive up to Reno, pack all my stuff, come back home for two days and then fly up to, or no, I'm sorry, fly to Cincinnati to sign my contract in person to sign my contract and do my physical, I had to do my physical and everything. Um, and then next day I fly to Billings. So I land in Billings, go straight to the field, have like four hours to lay down. And I'm just sitting on my, I brought all my luggage at the field. Everything's at the field. And, uh, you know, the manager at the time, Ray Martinez he called me in. He's like, Hey, you know, introduce myself and talk to him. And he's like, you know, I want to give you the data just and settle and rest. Don't worry about it. You're good. I'm like, okay, cool. I appreciate that. But I was like, I'll, I'm ready to go. Like, you know, there's only a month left. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd like to play a little bit. So if you need me, I'm, I'm ready. Um, so BP comes around and one of our other outfielders jammed his thumb the night before in second base. And uh, he comes up to me, BP is like, hey, I know you're going to rest today, but would you be okay to start in center? I'm like, yeah, sure. That's why I'm here. Like, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. And uh, yeah, why not? Like, I don't just want to sit around all day. This is perfect. So, yeah, so I go out and, and, and have that. My first, I mean, my first at bat, you know, I, I got a middle end fastball and put a swing on it and I'm sprinting out of the box and I'm like, I know I hit it well, but I'm just sprinting out of the box and I'm kind of rounding the bases and I'm like, man, God is good. That's all I, I mean, that's all I did. And then the second time, then I was like, this can't be real. <laughs> like, this, something's happening. this can't be real. Um, yeah, and I still got teammates who talk about it to this day. Taylor Trammell, Tyler Stevenson, guys like that talk about it to this day because, you know, I went homer, homer. I got hit by pitch on the back knee. Then my last at bat, I laid down a bunt for a hit. And so, you know, that's just everyone now after playing with these guys for like five, six years, everyone's like, yeah, that, that's you. Yeah. Like, you may hit a couple home runs, but you're going to lay a bunt down. <laughs> right, and exactly. So, and so it was, yeah, it was crazy, but it was, you know, such a blessing. How did the grind of the minor leagues help you now for the majors? I mean, first things first is just understanding the travel schedule mm. and and being on, especially in that league, it's the Pioneer League where I first went to. You got 18-hour bus rides down to Utah, um, you know, all over that, that uh, upper northern part of the U.S. and uh, driving around Montana, Idaho Falls, or things like that, and, you know, you're used to college travel, but then you kind of, that hits you in the face because it's like, no, 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 you're playing every day. Mm -hmm. Like college, you're just playing on weekends and then you get the week to get back and and kind of settle in and then fly out again. But once you realize it's every day and it's just like, you get slapped in the face. Um, But it's good. I mean, it's things that you have to learn because you have to learn and listen to your body. And, you know, at that time I was 21. And then as the years have gone on and, you know, I'm not 21 anymore, you know, you have to listen to your body and kind of understand what percentage of your ability you have that day. 
Um, and so it's tough and it's grueling, but it's important. That's, that's the biggest thing I say is it's very important to lead me to now with 162 games of now you're instead of 18 hour bus rides, you're just flying from city to city, but the travel schedule is still taxing on your body. So it's important about recovery and understanding your body and knowing what percentage you have that day, because you can't always be a hundred percent. So, um, that's, it's, it's, to me, it was very important. How did you get told that you were going to the show? Um, we were in uh, Memphis, and uh, you know I'd been having a good season, and and I'd been feeling well. But you know another thing, I wasn't on the forty man, and so I kind of I kind of knew at that at that time going through the minors of how important that is to to the accessibility of being on the forty man to being called up and down instead of having to make transactions and moves. Um, so it's towards the end of the season and, um, you know, I'm kind of just doing well and trying to finish strong in triple a and, and leave a good impression. Um, and I got pulled out of, and I have had a really good relationship with that trip, the manager, Pat Kelly at the time. And he'd been my double a manager, triple a manager. And so like, I had a really good relationship with him and he knows me really well and he knows what grinds my gears. And so I remember I popped up to like second base something to end the inning with a runner on and I was pissed. And, uh, so I come in the dugout, put my helmet down, put my gloves down. He calls me. He's like, no, 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 you're not going back out there. He's like, put your stuff down, take your cleats off. You're coming out of the game. And so, you know, the way my mind works is I start wondering, what did I do? Did I, did I not run? And I was like, did I pop up and like slam my bat and not run? And I start rethinking the whole thing. And I'm like, I, I ran down to first. And I was like, I, I knew I got out, but like, I didn't, didn't think I showed anyone up. So I started overthinking it. And this is like the fourth inning. And he let this go on the whole game. And I'm, <laughs> I'm asking a hitting coach. I'm asking the other guys, I'm, like I'm asking the whole dugout. Hey, what did I do? Did I do something? And he hears. So afterwards he told me, but like he heard me asking everybody. And he's like, I just wanted to, I just wanted to make you mad. And so after the game in Memphis, you go up the stairs and you pass the manager's office before you get to the clubhouse. So I come in, I bring my stuff in, I'm walking in and I'm walking in with the other guys. And he goes, Friedel, like, get your, get your butt in here. He's like, get your butt in here right now. And, uh, I go in his office and, and he sits me down and he goes, Hey, so, um, I heard you were asking everybody on the team what, why I pulled you, like what you did wrong, like why I pulled you, what was the incident? He's like, if you got a problem, you come to me and you talk to me. He's like, you want to know something? You talk to me. You come up to me and you ask me because I'll tell you why. You want to know why? You're going to the show. <laughs> and I like, and I was kind of sitting there and I like, and then just came over me. I'm like, what? What did you, <laughs> what did you? And everyone at the time knew. They had told everyone else besides me that it was happening. And so, you know, a lot of guys in the team were waiting outside of his office, like their ears up to the door, <laughs> listening in. And, and as soon as he said it, everyone rushed in and like congratulated me. Um, it was such a surreal feeling to to be able to have that opportunity. Um, man, we had just finished a night game, and he was like, "Hey, you're, you're flying out tomorrow at six a.m." Me and another guy, Art Warren, who's a pitcher, we actually got called up together. Um, he had been up and down that year. So he was like, are you and Art are flying out at 6 a.m.? They had a day game. So since he had a day game the next day, so he's like, you guys flying out at 6 a.m., you'll probably get in at like 10, um, go right to the field. So I'm going call my parents, call my wife, call, you know, everybody, let them know, hey, this just happened. Um, and I don't get back to the hotel until midnight because I had to pack up my locker and do all this stuff. And I didn't sleep a lick. I like I laid down in bed. I packed my stuff up, called everyone, and um, I didn't sleep a lick. And finally, at five fifty, my alarm goes off, and our our Uber's at six. And I'm like, "Well, here we go. <laughs> like, let's see, <laughs> let's see what's gonna happen." Like, I I didn't sleep at all, but I have so much adrenaline going right now. I feel like I'm wide awake. Um, and so we flew up to Cincy and got in there, and uh, yeah, it was just it was incredible. Like I just and you know it was actually funny. I told my parents so they flew they flew out to Cincy for the game. Um, my wife was actually eight months pregnant, so she couldn't come to my debut. She couldn't fly. Mm. Um, but my, I was, we got off the plane and I was going to the baggage claim and I look up and I see a Friedel Jersey on like, they have these little escalators that take you to baggage claim. And I see a Friedel Jersey. And I was like, 
blonde hair, Frito jersey. I'm like, I look at art. And I'm like, that's my mom. <laughs> and, and he's like, what? And so I walked up and surprised her. He recorded the whole thing. And I walked up and like surprised her. And, and she turns around and I'm like, what? what? What are you doing? Like all this stuff. So that was, that was a pretty cool moment too, to see her and kind of go with her. Super cool. You debuted on September 8th, 2021 as a pitch hitter, but your first MLB hit is another crazy one. It's a home run. You had two AB home runs to start off the rookie league. Then you get to the show and you hit one out too. How surreal. Great. It, it was that same feeling, man. It was, it was the same feeling as Billings. I just, you know, the day before I pinch hit off of, uh, I don't remember who it was. Uh, someone like, Oh uh, no, it wasn't Joe Kelly. I don't, but it was like curveball, change up, change up three pitches. You're out. And I was like, cool. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then I got to go home and sleep and rest and have a normal night. Um, and so the next day I got another opportunity and, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be aggressive. I'm not going to, not going to take my time. Not, I'm going to get my pitch and swing at it in middle and fastball. And it was the same reaction as Billings. And I swung and I hit it and I knew I hit it well. And, but I just sprint out of the box. I just put my head down. I'm sprinting out of the box and I get around first base and it clears. And, um, that's the same thing. I just looked up to the sky and I was like, God, God is good, man. I, there's no other explanation for that besides that. The fact that, you know, being in there in that situation with that opportunity and then having that happen, it's just, it was such a blessing. Did you get the ball and did you have to make a trade for it? So Mookie Betts actually, um, I didn't know about this till after the game. So I went in and I didn't even think about getting the ball back. I, I was, there's so much adrenaline going. I was like, cool. Like awesome. Um, and I found out after Mookie Betts turned around and he knew it was my first hit because he saw yesterday on the board, they put MLB debut. And so he knew it was my first hit. Um, and he asked for the ball back from the fan. And I guess the fan just threw it back and, and threw it back to him. And he threw it in and cause he was in my locker after the game. I'm like, Oh cool. You guys got the ball back And our uh, clubhouse manager, Rick Stowe was like, yeah, you know what happened? I'm like, no. And so he showed me the video. So Mookie went in at, and then going into the seventh inning, I think it was, he brought the bat out on the field and handed it to the fan and like gave him a signed Mookie Betts bat to get my ball back. Um, and so I had the opportunity to talk to him after the game and just thank him. And um, you know, for him to do something like that was, was just you know incredible. You know, outside of what you've done with the bat, what's the feeling like when you make a sliding catch to rob probably the best player in base, Otani? It was, uh, that was pretty incredible. Um, you know, just certain instances like that where you kind of just step back and you're like, you know, standing next to Freddie Freeman on first base. And actually last year in 2022, um, pools last year, St. Louis, and there's some time standing on first base that I'm like, well, that's our pools. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I still have those moments where it's like, like you said, diving catch, take away an extra base hit from Shohei. Um, little things like that for me that just like you know, make me grateful you know, and, and something that I'll never take, you know, hopefully I have a long career in this game and I continue to play and continue to play, but you know, it's something I never want to take for granted. What was the biggest takeaway for you for 23? Cause it was more of a roller coaster season, not just for you, but for the team as well, getting in the playoff hunt. And then it just seemed like that. I mean, I follow the reds on the national league side. I'm a big white Sox fan, but on the national league side, I follow your team, but it was a big roller coaster season. The 2023 season for us as a whole, was great because you know we start the season off and there's no expectations we're just going to put our head down and play our game and um kind of started off tough i think we were four and twelve um at the beginning there and and uh you know for us to kind of battle back and be like hey listen this isn't us like let's go play our game let's play loose let's play free no expectations let's do what we do um after a tough pittsburgh series early on we went back and swept the rangers at home like two out of three games were walk-offs. And for us, that was a big turning point for the confidence of that team. And that was very early on. That's before we called anyone up. And so we were like, all right, like we know what we're capable of. Um, and so we just kind of went off of that and our ability. And then all of a sudden you call up Matt McClain and Ellie and, and these young guys who you want to make an impact right away. But at the same time, it's like, listen, like they're rookies, you know, let's just see what they're going to do. Just play loose and free and join the team. And, um, you know, they hit the ground running. And that first half going on that 12 game win streak. Um, and it was just having fun. You know, the biggest thing for us was like, there was no pressure, no expectations. So let's just go out and have fun. 
let's go out and play our game and do what we do and see what happens. Um, then at the end of the first half, we're right there in first place at the NL Central. And, and we're playing very meaningful games and important games. And um, But the important part was coming back in the second half and kind of starting off the second half in like a lull of like, where do we pick back up? You know, we got to find it again. These games start to matter. Um, and so I think to be able to do that with the group that we had and the young guys that we had was very important because we bounced back in the second half. And we started, we, you know, we, we almost lost it a couple of times. And, you know, we had to really fight the last, especially the last three weeks, you know, every single pitch, every single game mattered. Um, so just being able to learn with that, get that experience for, for me, first of all, like for me, how young I am, like in the MLB, um, you know, I'm still, I just got on my rookie, my rookie status last year. So our whole team is so young mixed with older veteran guys. I think to be able to get that experience right away, and kind of understand how meaningful those games are down the stretch is very important because every single one of us is going to learn from and be like, okay, like, you know, we missed out on this opportunity. We had this game that we, you know, we could have, we could have won and slipped, but instead it's like, no, now we know how important every game is. There are 162 games that it came down to one game. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that was very important. And, and for us to a know the talent and the ability that we have as a group, and then B, get that experience of just missing by game to bring that into the 24 season ready to go from game one. Like from game one, it's hit the ground running. So, You know, you said that you're basically still proving yourself at the major league level and you've been proving yourself from day one pretty much your whole career. What message do you have to young players that you could give them to about, you know, you just, you got to continue to go up to the next notch, even though you may have, got one rung on the ladder. You got to continue to grind it. And I think you're a perfect example of that. If Yeah. I think, you know, for me, it's just, for me personally, it's important to never be satisfied, to never be content with where I'm at. Um, you know, I've been able to accomplish a lot of things in my life and that I'm very grateful for. Um, I'm very blessed to have these opportunities, but at the same time it's to never be satisfied with where I'm at. Um, and, you know, you make your debut and, and I, and I still remember it, it'll, it'll stick with me. My first big league camp was 2019 and I was hitting BP before camp started with Taylor Trammell in the outfield and we were picking up the balls and we were with Barry Larkin and Barry Larkin told us at the time, he said, Hey, listen, like, you know, we're really pushing for you guys. You know, we want you guys to make your debut, but just remember making your debut is one thing. Sticking around and having a long career is a whole nother animal. And he, you know, and that's coming from a Hall of Fame shortstop who played for, for, for a long, long, had a great career. But, you know, that really stuck with me because it's like, okay, cool. Like, I, I made my debut. I got called up. Um, but that's not it. That's not the goal. The goal is not to make your debut. Okay, I made the MLB. Amazing. Perfect. No, it's how do I stay? How, what do I have to do to prove myself to stand out and stay and stick around and have a long, successful career? Um, and so for me, it's just been the mindset of never be satisfied, you know, never be content with where you are, always continue to work, you know, put your head down and work and do the things that you have to do to get better, to better yourself each and every day. Um, you know, that's something for me that that's helped push me, you know, every off season, every year going into the next year, it's like, okay, 2023 was a good year. I had a good season. Cool. That was awesome. No, instead it's like, how do I build on that? Yeah, it was a great year. 2022 is awesome. But how do I repeat that and then make it better? And then make it better in the year after that. Um, and so for me, it's kind of just never being, like I said, never being satisfied, never being content. And you know, also there's going to be adversity, especially in the game of baseball, yeah. in life, you know, in baseball, whatever sport, there's always adversity. It's not going to go good all the time. And I think having an understanding of knowing that and acknowledging that and acknowledging that maybe, Hey, this might be a like I'm heading towards a slump, right? Like instead of pushing off and being like, no, I'll be fine. I'm fine. I'll be fine. No, acknowledge that, acknowledge that it's coming, accept it and then learn how to get out of it. And for me, that's a big thing, especially in baseball is, you know, knowing it's like a clock, right? I learned this a couple of years ago. It's like a never ending clock. You hit P you hit parts where you, okay, I'm starting to feel good. And then you hit parts where it's like, wow, I'm in, I'm, I'm seeing the ball. Well, I'm hitting well, everything's going great. Then you start to feel like it's coming. Like, okay, I'm starting to lose that feeling. And then you hit the slump. Now, the difference maker is how can you shorten that part of the clock of the slump? 
how can you shorten that say the hands on a clock right instead of nine to twelve how can you make that 10 to 12, 11 to 12, shorten that slump towards like, okay, now how do I get out of this and get back to the phase where I'm starting to feel better. So, yeah. um, yeah, those are pretty important things for me that help me get through. You talked about the off season. You're here in Las Vegas as I am, and you do your work at the gym with the guy that we both know and Rob Martinez, who's a certified expert in sports specific training, functional movement and injury reduction. I've sent numerous people to Rob. I can't speak Highly enough about him, folks, the gym is located in Las Vegas at 7165 South Buffalo Drive. He'll do a functional movement screen on you. I mean, the guy is an expert at what he does. But tell me, what's Rob done for you at the gym for you in the off seasons? Well, I think right there, what you said about the functionality test right away, um, that's actually something that my first five years in spring training we did every spring training you get into spring training the first thing you do is that functionality range movement testing fms testing that's what we did every year and, and that's how you point out your deficiencies where your weaknesses are what you need to work on so i go to rob i think it was 2020 2020 i went to rob or maybe it was right before that or maybe a little bit before that and you know i just walked in i didn't have a place to train so i just walked in he said let me do a, a fms testing on you and as soon as he said that i'm like whoa I was like, you do FMS testing here? <laughs> and I went to the whole FMS testing just like I did with the Reds every spring training. And at that point, I was like, okay, like this guy knows exactly what's going on. He knows how to understand the human body. He knows deficiencies. And I spent my first off season with him and it was incredible. I mean, we sat down, we looked at every part of my body, where my deficiencies were, where my weaknesses were, where my strengths were. And he built a whole workout plan for the whole off season, the entirety of off season, every single segment was building up to a different point. And so it was eye opening for me because I was like, man, like this is what I need. This is what I've been missing because you go into the off season and you know, no one gives you the right or wrong things to do. It's kind of like, um, you can get workout plans, you can get workout instructions, but at the same time, you got to find your own training at where you're spending the off season. And so for me, finding him and finding the gym and having him kind of break down my body and tell me where my weaknesses are and deficiencies are and how to make that stronger and build that was eye opening because it was like, this is incredible. And ever since then, you know, the 2021 season, 22 season, 23, 23 season, um, he's right there with me. Even when I leave Vegas, he texts me, stay up to date with me, see how I'm doing, follow up with games, talk about good games, bad games. Um, this past year, he came out to L.A. when we played the Dodgers with his son, Robbie. And, uh, you know, I was able to sit down with him and talk with him about how I'm feeling, how my body's feeling, you know, something sore. And that's one thing he always says is like, call me, text me, reach out to me. If something's sore, something's bothering you, let me know. We can figure out ways to to get in the gym and strengthen that or work around that, activate that muscle, whatever it may be. But, you know, he's something I trust every offseason coming back to, to have that comfort and peace of mind. To like, nope, I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly who I'm training with. And I know exactly, I sit down with him every offseason. I rest, let my body heal. And as soon as I start back up again, I get in with him and we sit down and we do the same test every offseason. We look at every deficiency and every time there's something new. And every time it's a new plan to where like, Hey, when this year, we're going to get stronger with this. You know, I had a couple of oblique injuries last year, this whole off season, just been hammering obliques and cores and making that stronger to build up for the season to be like, Hey, we're not having that again. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to activate properly. We're going to do the right things we need to do to get you to 162 games. Um, so he's been amazing. I tell you what listeners, I'm going to be able to help you because you're going to, you can train with Rob as well. He's not just for professional athletes. He's for everybody. Everyone. I'm I'm going to put a link in the show notes to Rob's yeah. website. And also you can follow him on Instagram um, at the gym, Las Vegas, but you get connect. If you're in Las Vegas, you have to get connected with Rob. I mean, I'm not just saying it, but you're hearing it from TJ too. Amazing. Yeah. You have to at least reach out to him and go get the testing done because that's so important to understand your body and understand your deficiencies and weaknesses and just go in, get the testing done, walk, sit down and talk through some things with him. And I promise you, you'll just, it'll be really eye opening. Let's end it on this, something away from baseball. Second cousin is Kentucky head basketball coach, John Calipari. And you're also cousins with Sean Miller from Xavier and Archie Miller from Rhode Island. So you got, you got some lineage there. That's, that's why I was always going to basketball. You know, I wanted, I wanted to make basketball work. I always wanted to make it work. You know, I always found so much joy in basketball, but just didn't have a good three-point shot. <laughs> <laughs> As I came to that conclusion when I was in high school, I'm like, you know what? I think baseball is going to be the path. 
Has any of these guys come out and watched you play? Yeah, I was able to, uh, Sean, well, you know, Sean's at Xavier. So I get to see him uh, a couple of times a year. Um, last season, he actually thought when he, 2022, he got the head coaching job back at Xavier. He came out through the first pitch and I mm-hmm. caught it. Um, so he threw it out to me and I got to catch up with him and talk with him. And uh, yeah, Coach Cow, Coach Cow will come up to a couple of games throughout the season. You know, he's busy. And, you know, the summer months for them recruiting wise are very hectic. So um, he he links up with my dad when my dad comes out to games and they get together and he'll watch a couple of games too. So uh, it's always good to see those guys. Cool. Well, TJ, man, best of luck to you in 2024 and best of luck with the Reds. And I appreciate some time and coming on the show. Thanks, Tommy. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Listeners, don't forget the podcast docu-series in support of Native American rights of the harsh and unfair treatment of the indigenous community. I did it along with filmmaker Antonino D'Ambrosio. It's entitled A Heartbeat and a Guitar, Johnny Cash, and the Making of Bitter Tears. I'll put a link in the show notes to the entire docu-series that you can check it out from there. That's going to do it for this episode of Before the Lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin-chin.